What I'd like to talk about is issues relating to the safety of cars. So I would like to start with this quick pop quiz. Anybody know what this picture represents? Any ideas? Did someone say Tesla something? Uber. Uber? Tesla? Okay, this is the picture of the uh, Tesla um, crash that uh, in 2016 killed uh, its passenger while driving in a semi-automatic mode. Which means, in last year, there were about a million and a quarter people around the world who died because of accidents caused by people. And there was one person who died because of accident with a robotic driver. Guess which one of these you've heard about. So this is an important piece of information. It represents the public uh, acceptance levels to casualties due to robots. And it is pretty clear that if we start having autonomous cars, and they will kill people, and be quite certain about this, these cars will kill people. They killed one last year, they will kill people. And the level of acceptance that we are seeing to robotic caused deaths is about a million times more sensitive than it is to people caused deaths. Of course, uh, I see people disagreeing. Sure, maybe it's not one to million, maybe it's only one to uh, 10,000, but it's quite clear that people will not accept a million deaths each year caused by robots. The autonomous car has to be way safer, on average, than the current cars with human drivers. We, need, we don't just need 99% safety. We need 99.99 and maybe even 99.999% safety. Which means ISO 26262, which is the current standard for safety, is probably not enough. It doesn't probably represent what the public will be willing to accept before it tries to either bankrupt uh, companies with uh, lawsuits or just outright rejection of uh, the possibility of autonomous cars. So we need to start thinking about risks and how we're going to handle risks uh, in this brave new world of autonomous cars. Which is why I brought this picture. It's a pretty schematic picture and it's quite obvious. But I think it's important for us to be aware of what it is that we're talking about when talking about risk. And there are two types of uh, risks that we need to handle, and this is coming from the 26262 definition. There are systematic failures, and systematic failures can be the software or hardware. Uh, most people know these systematic errors, failures by a different name. They're also called bugs. This is where you caused a problem in the way you designed, either wrote the software or created the hardware or some other mechanism. You designed the thing wrong either hardware or software. Then there are also random hardware failures, which again are split into two. They may be transient or permanent. Random hardware failures are cases where, ir irrespective of the way you designed the thing, it breaks down either momentarily and then goes back to being good, or it breaks down completely and then stays bad. These two are also things that might happen. Transients are typically caused by radiation, uh, ultra-fast, ultra-energetic particles coming from outer space and hitting your, uh, your chip. And don't think this is, a, um, you know, this is something which is very rare. This happens in a typical chip, like the ones in this phone. It happens once every four minutes. Every four minutes, a photon with the right level of energy hits your chip. Now, sure, all of, almost all of these cases mean nothing. But it's basically a Russian roulette. Every four seconds, pew, there's something happening. And yeah, the odds are very much in your favor. But these odds build up. And you need to be safe from them. And you also need to be safe from the cases where due to various situations, random effects, noise, dust, whatever, your chip broke down, some fuse broke, some transistor dislocated. And then you also need to be sure that you're safe from these, because you don't want one of these to be hitting your brakes when you're running at 120 MPH on a major highway in Germany. 
So as I said, systematic failures, you can handle them with bad prevention. Now, bad prevention is easier said than done, but at least it's something we know about. We have some idea what is needed from us. Uh, permanent failures are handled today in the way manufacturing is done, because after manufacturing of chips, there's a stage called test, where you make sure that the part you created is good. Subject to the theory of uh, infant mortality, which says a lot of the defects show themselves up almost immediately after you manufacture, so you screen for them. So there are some various techniques of how to handle them. The least understood today is the transients. What do we do about them? By the time we try to detect them, they have disappeared, or not. And they could cause any kind of mischief, because they are completely random in nature. The only thing that you can do is to, to design for safety. And this is a buzzword that we'll start hearing more and more as we go into the very, very safe chips, and the chips that have to be very, very critical. The mission critical chips, the mission is becoming way, way more critical. So we need to start thinking about designing for safety. And what do you mean by design for safety? First, there's the reference model. The ultimate reference model for de design for safety is the full redundancy model. If I take, instead of one chip, if I take three chips and add some voting uh, how, uh, logic around them, so that every single decision is made by a, a majority vote between three different chips, and assuming that the logic, that, that the glue logic I've put between them is safe, that's a different story, but for now let's assume the actual voting is safe, then you have squared the probability of a problem. If in one chip the probability of a problem is one in a million, then in a three-way voting, the probability is 1 to the million squared. So 10 to the minus 6, it's 10 to the minus 12, which almost always is good enough. So you take three chips, you do a vote, and you make any kind of decision based on that. Great, safe. Only it costs 3x the amount it, you, uh, you wanted to pay. And not just cost in money. Cost can be in weight, in volume, in power dissipation. Whatever hurts you, you have to pay three times for that. Now, when you're building an airplane or a, your rocket ship, then probably 3x the electronics cost is something you can pay for. In automotive, you cannot. Right now, the, the systems, the autonomous systems, are tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars in cost. But even if they go down in serial production to mere few thousands, not something you want to triplicate when you're creating a, a, a car. So now you have a model for safety. This is how you get good safety, but now I want to do it slightly lower cost. And that means you need to, to find ways to mitigate your transient faults, and you need to find ways to, uh, to detect, at least, the permanent faults. And these are different mechanisms, because transient faults you can't really detect, because they are so fleeting. But there are ways to mitigate their influence. In permanent faults, it's pretty easy to detect because they are so permanent. Tests will find them. But it's not so easy to mitigate. It's easy to detect, and then something else needs to do something about the fact that you have detected a problem. So diving a little into details, because you know, this is a, I was told this is an engineering discussion and we want some details. Uh, these are the basic models for redundancy. There's uh, what we call lockstep, which is 2x the cost. You take two and you either compare them or you have a main CPU or main chip running and some shadow chip just checking it all the time and flagging if it made a mistake or not. This is 2x the cost, not 3, but it doesn't have the ability to correct. If there is a mismatch, you don't know if the master or the slave, if the first or the second is in error, or you know that there is an error. So in cases where you know what to do, for example, in advisory systems, where it's OK for the advisory system just to be quiet, if there's a mismatch, the system will just shut up. It's OK for an advisory once in I don't know, X amount of time. It doesn't give you an advice it should have. OK. But if, again, if it's your brake system and it's full autonomous, you don't have this option. Then there's three-way TMR, the triple, triple modular redundancy. And it's down there on the bottom, uh, what TMR stands for. That costs you 3x, and it allows you to, uh, to decide what to do. Two are good, one is 
probably in error. The probability of both being in the same error is very low. And for very, very extreme cases, you have nine-way TMR of TMRs. You implement the same thing three times, and you do TMRs, and you can compare them. Now, just before delving into the systems that implement uh, mitigation of transient faults, just want to remind you the transient faults are real. It sounds, uh, uh, as my boss sometimes says, science fiction. Yeah, uh, um, radiation from outer space, sure. In this case from 2009, I believe, uh, where the Toyota recall cost them uh, millions in compensation and billions in fines to the US government, is probably due to uh, uh, transient fault. It's very difficult to prove in a court of law that there was a transient fault, but expert witnesses testify that it's quite probable because they were not safe enough for transients. So it's not clear if it was the reason, but it's definitely part of the reason they had to pay all that huge amount of money. So it's real. So how can I um, mitigate transient fault? Well, one way I can do, as I mentioned before, I can do redundancy. The redundancy can be modular or time. T modular redundancy is just putting three parts. And time redundancy means running the same software three times uh, and comparing the results sequentially. That will, as I said, will give you an expensive but complete solution. Some people prefer to use some specialized hardware to address this issue, and I have a list on the next foil, and uh, I'll be posting my foils in LinkedIn. So uh, people who want to go into slightly more detail can do so afterwards. Um, but these are localized fo focus. They are incomplete. They don't solve everything. Some things they solve well. The, the best example, obviously, is ECC for memories, which has a clear uh, limit of how many errors it can detect, how many errors it can correct. This is a good specialized hardware for memories only. Then the third way is to do selective flop hardening. Go to your flops and specific ones, the important ones, you harden them against radiation, either by raising the capacitance on them, which of course makes them slower and more power consumption, but uh, it prevents certain amount of the um, radiation photons from flipping them, or you can actually implement TMR for a specific flop, making it again very probably safe. But this can only be done if you have exhaustive fault simulation that enables you to check using simulation all your uh, faults, all your flops, and make sure that uh, you know which flops to harden and which don't need to be hardened. So as I said, examples of hardware mechanisms like the ECC, CRC, uh, um, hardware redundancy, monitoring for relevant events and timeouts, external monitoring on the connection pins, physical filters which are very good for analog type uh, disruptions, and detection of illegal values, among other mechanisms. For permanent faults, you, uh, again, can use redundancy, modular, not time redundancy, because uh, if you do the same calculation three times, you have a permanent fault, you'll get the same error three times. Not a good idea. But modular redundancy will protect you. Specialized hardware, similar to the ones for transients, or you can do hardware or software-based self-test, which covers all the things that it covers. So when you have a test, you can run the test, and if the result is fine, then you know that all the faults that this test has covered did not happen. But tests do not cover all the faults, and typically you don't always know which fault it covers and which fault it doesn't. If you want to know what it covers, if you want to improve its coverage, again, you need to have exhaustive fault simulation to analyze every single potential fault and see if this test covers it or not. After you've done all of this, you also need to validate. And validation is a key concept across the design and obviously here as well. So you need to, uh, to validate what you've done. Now, modular redundancy, it's easy to know what their safety is. ECC, again, it's easy to know. But everything else, all the mechanisms, all the hardening, all the things you can do, are, uh, needs validation, and validation, again, talks about either fault simulation, expert judgment, which is a huge thing today. 
you have an expert, you pay them a lot of money, they come look at your design and say, I think this is safe enough. And then you are wonderful. Uh, in specific cases, formal verification tools might be used, or sometimes people take a part to an ion chamber and bombard it with uh, extremely high levels of radiation and see what happens. It's not a very accurate model, but it's something. So, exhaustive fault simulation keeps coming up in this uh, presentation, no, not completely by chance. So, you need tens of millions of simulations. How can you do it with a, just a small bunch of CPUs in a week? So, yeah, if you can do every fault in under two seconds and you have 25 CPUs in a week, that's fine. Typical simulation time, mm, hours, not two seconds. So you have two options. You can do selective simulation, simulate just a few, a small subset, and have this expert I mentioned before come in and tell you, yes, this uh, subset that you've mentioned, it's the right subset. If, it's, if it passes, everything else passes. Or you can check out our solutions offline. Call me, talk to me offline uh, about some of the solutions uh, Optima has for that. So in summary, Protection from random faults is critical. It's a critical component to get the levels of safety that we talked about that prevent you from being uh, in the news for killing people. And I tried try to quickly review several ways you can do it. Every solution has pros and cons, obviously, and almost all of them require validation. So we would strongly recommend you carefully plan what it is you want to do. Any questions? Then I suggest that people who have questions talk to me offline, let the rest go to the happy hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>